We all know that Vikings ravaged Scotland's shores, but could this have been the site of the last Viking battle in Scottish history? If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen and ring the notification bell to be told when I upload new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. When Vikings attacked Iona in 759 AD, it began a new era in Scotland. You might even say it's what created Scotland. That external threat was at least part of the impetus that drove the Picts and the Scots together to form Alapa. On the edges of Alapa, Viking raiders became settlers in Caithness, the Hebrides and Dumfries and Galloway. Now, every time I use the word Viking as a proper noun, there's a pedant in the comment section to point out, I think you'll find it's not a proper noun, it's a verb. They weren't Vikings. Vikings were what they did. To go a Viking was an act of plundering. Now, before you do that, Type Viking in a word and see if the spell checker makes the initial V the capital of a proper noun. Anyway, let's pretend I'm making these videos in 21st century Scotland as opposed to 8th century Viking land. Okay, so there's a continuum that starts with plundering Vikings, gradually develops into North settlers and ends with Scandinavian kingdoms. 500 years after they brutally attacked the monks of Iona, when Alexander III and his Scots army secured the Hebrides by mercilessly crushing Hurkan IV and his men at the Battle of Largs, we wouldn't call them Vikings. In 1469, when we gained the Northern Isles because James III married Margaret of Denmark, she wasn't a Viking. 25 miles down the coast is Aberdeen. Across the North Sea is Denmark. Just along the cliffs, there's a castle where Dracula was invented. And halfway between that first Viking raid in Iona and that last Battle of Largs in 1263, bloodthirsty Vikings had landed and made a base on a hillock just over there on the edge of the village. Three centuries of Roman attempts to take these lands had turned tribal groups into the Picts. 200 years of Viking attempts had seen the Picts and the Gaels become Scots. Now Sven Forkbeard Haraldson decided that he'd failed one too many times against the Scots. Now he was going to take Scotland once and for all. So in the summer of 1012 he sent a huge force under the leadership of the warrior hero that was his firstborn son, Canute. He was still young but he proved himself in battle. Leading the Scots was Malcolm II. Now, Malcolm II's first steps as a military leader had been a disaster. When he became King of Scots, he'd led a raid south into Northumbria and met his match in Uhtred. Untold numbers of Scottish warriors ended up with their heads on spikes. But that was six years ago. Now, Malcolm was more cautious. Now the Danes had landed and made a settlement on the Hack Law, the low hill on the edge of the modern village. Given the size of Canute's forces, Malcolm decided not to take them head on. Instead, he harassed them with skirmishing and intercepted food supplies to deny them sustenance. With neither supplies or access to the harvest of their land, they would be starved back to their ships. After a while, this started to frustrate the Scots. They wanted to get in about them. They wanted battle. They even threatened mutiny if the king didn't comply. It kind of puts you in mind of that section of the later Declaration of Our Broth that said that we had chosen Robert the Bruce. Yet, if he should give up what he's begun, seeking to make us 
or our kingdom subject to the King of England or the English, we should exert ourselves at once to drive him out as our enemy and a subverter of his own rights and ours and make some other man who was well able to defend us our king. The same was true of Malcolm II and the Viking foe now. Malcolm was forced in all-out confrontation. It was a bloody battle. Accounts talk of a terrible slaughter, the worst of which took place here on what's now the golf course. But artefacts and remains show that the fighting spread as much as four miles inland. At the end of the day's fighting, the two sides disengaged and retreated to camp to lick their wounds. The next morning, when they saw the carnage of the dead bodies strewn across the battlefield here, they came to a decision. Clerics on both sides of what were nominally Christian nations pushed for a treaty. Canute and his Norwegians and Danes would go back to their ships and withdraw their forces from Scotland. Malcolm would bury the dead of both sides honourably. And this would be consecrated ground. Cruden Bay would be the last Viking battle in Scottish soil. And that sacred ground is now a golf course. Canute would go on to easier pickings, invading and subduing England. Long before it was a golf course, the dead were buried and a chapel was built to commemorate the treaty. The chapel was dedicated to St Olaf, the patron saint both of Norway and Denmark. It was the first church here in Cruden. The place is now called Cruden Bay, the Bay of Crochden, slaughter of the Danes. There's nothing left of that church now, apart from one thing. As I'm walking to the modern Episcopal church, it's worth mentioning that I'll be doing my show Stories of Scotland in the Town Hall here in Cruden Bay on the 24th of November. You can get tickets by clicking top right, of course, and as always, you can get dates and tickets for all my upcoming tour shows using the link in the description below. Now, a visit to St James the Less Episcopalian Church in Cruden Bay takes us right back to the 11th century. You see, here in this modern church is the only part of that ancient chapel that survived. Rescued in Victorian times from the last remnants of the crumbling chapel is the font carved from Peterhead granite that dates all the way back to the original. Isn't that incredible? This simple font has survived a thousand years on windswept northeastern shores, a memorial to the peace agreed, a tribute to the fallen warriors of that last battle between Scots and Vikings. Give us a thumbs up or support the channel by clicking top right to become a Patreon member or buy me a coffee in the description below. In the meantime, I'm in Dorcas, Gumbi Lamai. Sherry and Rast.